Hello and welcome back to the cloudchurch.org. I'm Robert Breaker, missionary evangelist to Spanish and English speaking people. And we're going through our authorized King James 1611 Bible. And we're going verse by verse through the epistles of Paul in order when they're written. We're now in Galatians chapter 5. And we are beginning in verse 13. Last time we talked about a lot of interesting things. And uh, I, uh, I enjoyed it. I, I hope it was a blessing. And we showed really hard the difference between the law and grace and how people that are under the law do the law in the flesh. But when we're saved and under grace, we walk in the Spirit. We also looked how the law is works, but grace, we're saved by faith. Those who are under the law were under bondage, but we who are saved by faith have liberty. What does the law do? The law focuses on the sinner, and it asks, what I do? The law is all about what I do. If you're under the law, it's me, me, me. Look at me. Look at what I do. But how under grace, it's all what Jesus did. And it's look at Jesus. Look what he's done for us. Because the Bible teaches that he died on the cross, was buried, and rose again the third day. The law over here was abolished. The law has ended because Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. So, we are no longer under the law according to the Bible. The law is over. It's done. We are now under grace, and we're saved by grace through faith. Um, we've seen that, and we will continue to see that, because that's what the Bible teaches and what Paul says. But we're almost pretty much to the end of that, and Paul changes his focus to a, fo a few other things. But yet, even though he changes his focus, he then turns his attention to what he calls the works of the flesh... And then, what he later calls the fruits of the Spirit. And so we're going to look at all of those today, hopefully. I'll be able to finish this chapter. So, we've turned from looking at the difference between the law and grace. And boy, are there differences. One saves and one doesn't. And we're here today, and we're saved by grace. But also, even though Paul's making a comparison, he says, okay, you want to do works and follow the law? Well, the law is against your own nature. Your own nature wants to do certain things. So when you're under the law, you have to put your flesh down. Well, over here, we're saved, and the Spirit gives us certain fruits of things that we do because we're saved, but we still have to fight the flesh. And that's what we'll be looking at today. So we'll begin in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. Galatians 5, 13. For, brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. So when we're saved, we receive liberty. We're free in Christ. So what does that mean? Well, look at what Jesus said. Um, we have to find it here. John chapter 8 and verse 36. Liberty. Liberty is freedom. Freedom. I guess I'm what you call a, a libertarian, I guess, because I just believe in freedom. Let a man do whatever he wants, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. Even if it's something stupid. I heard one time down in, in uh, Australia, there's people that are so dumb they smoke tadpoles. Well, I'd never smoke a tadpole. I think that's pretty stupid. But as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else, if a guy wants to be that dumb and wants to do something that stupid, that's his business. I won't bother him if he doesn't bother me. I'm what you call libertarian. <laughs> I believe in liberty. And liberty, if somebody wants to do something stupid, help themselves. Um, but in Christ, we have freedom. We have liberty. Only we're not to use that liberty or freedom for an occasion to the flesh. So we're free to do whatever we want in the Spirit. But we shouldn't do things in the flesh that are against uh, God's wishes. So look at what Jesus says about freedom or liberty. John chapter 8 and verse 36. John 8, 36. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. So if you become free, you're free indeed. Well, when we're saved, what are we freed from? We're freed from hell. We're also, and we looked at it last time, we're saved from sin. You see, when we're saved, um, we are a new creature. The flesh sins, but the new creature inside does not. We're, see, we're saved from the power of sin. I mean, someday the body might die, but our, we'll have a glorified body through Christ. So we're saved, and we have freedom, we have liberty. But look what he says in verse 13. For brethren, you have 
they called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So once again, this is all grace. Because of God's grace, it makes us love Him more. I remember as a kid, I followed my dad, I obeyed my dad, I did what my dad told me to do, but I sometimes didn't like it. But then my dad would sometimes bring me some things home. He'd bring me a gift. I remember because I got good grades in school one time, my dad bought me a watch, a digital watch. And I was so thankful. And I loved him even more and did more for him because I wanted to, not because I had to. That's a great illustration of the difference between the law and grace. Under the law, you have to do it, what it says. But under grace, because we have the free gift of salvation and liberty and freedom in Christ, we serve him because we want to. Not because we have to. So let me, I guess I'll, I'll write that up here too because that makes sense. Because you have to. We serve the law because you have to. Under grace we serve Jesus because we want to. There's a great difference. Uh, I think of Jonah in the Old Testament. It's a good example. God said, Jonah, you're going to go down to Nineveh and you're going to preach to those people. Well, that's something God told him to do. And he should have done it because God said to. But Jonah ran. From God's, I don't think so. Well, guess what happened to Jonah? Well, the Bible says he went into the whale for three days and three nights, and all of a sudden he had a want to serve the Lord. <laughs> and the Bible says when the whale vomited him out, it says he ran to Nineveh, which was a three days journey, and I think, if I remember right, he made it in one day. So God told him he had to do something, and he didn't want to do it. So God said, okay, Jonah, let me do something to you. And then he, he did something to Jonah that made Jonah want to serve him. And Jonah wanted to when he got out of the whale. Well, thank God, God doesn't do stuff like that today. Because of his great grace, now we love him more than we could ever love him if we were under the law. And because of his great grace, we want to do more for him. So, he said, true freedom is knowing you're saved and never doubting, doubting it. Freedom from bondage of the law. We're truly free when we're saved because we don't have fear. Uh, there's a verse. Let me see if I can find that. Uh, Perfect love casteth out fear, it says. I think it's in 1 John. I believe it's in 1 John. Yep, uh, 1 John 4.18. There is no fear in love because perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment. He that feareth is made, not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. So, over here, when you're under the law, you live in fear, wondering, oh, I hope that I'm saved. I hope I did good enough. But over here, perfect love casteth out fear. There's no fear under grace, because you know you're saved. You know you're on your way to heaven. Now, back to uh, verse 13 of Galatians chapter 5. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. That's something that we shouldn't do. God does not want us to sin. We can sin, because we're still in a sinful body after we're saved, but He doesn't want us to. Uh, look at Romans chapter 4 and verse 8. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now this right here shows us a difference. After we're saved, and I've, I've showed this before, I think, but I'll just go ahead and put it up here again, because even some Christians today don't see this. Oh, that doesn't look too good. When you, you've got three parts. You've got a body. Inside that body, you have a soul. Soul. And then inside that is the spirit. Now, when you're saved, the Holy Spirit of God comes inside of you in that body and seals you. So you become a new creature. And the new creature is God's spirit with your soul. But you are still inside that sinful, wicked body. And that body is the problem. That body is a body of sin. The Bible tells us to reckon the flesh dead. But we still have that flesh that still has sinful desires and still wants to do wrong. So there's going to be a fight. So blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. We just read in Romans 4 8. What is it that God does not impute sin to? He does not impute sin to the new creature. But that does not mean that you can't sin. Your body can sin and does. But that sin is already paid for at the cross. So when a Christian sins, he can't go to hell. 
Those sins are paid for. That sin is charged to his body, but the new creature inside belongs to God. So what does that mean? Well, that means that as a Christian, we have a battle to go on. And the battle is between the flesh and the spirit. One old preacher said it was like this, and I, don't, I guess I'll draw it here, and I am not a good artist, so please excuse me. I guess that's supposed to be a dog. <laughs> One preacher said that the Christian life is like two dogs fighting. Okay, so here's two dogs. There's a littler dog. Two dogs fighting. Huh, that, that looks more like a shark, doesn't it? Well, anyway, here's two dogs. And one preacher said the Christian life is like this. It's two dogs. It's the flesh fighting the spirit. And the one that you feed the most is the one that will grow the biggest. So if you love God and you read your Bible and you study and you pray and you live for the Lord and you walk in the spirit, then this dog will get bigger and it will be easier to fight this dog. But if you are a Christian that, that gets in the world and doesn't read your Bible as much, then this dog will get bigger, and it'll be easier for you to do wrong, and you'll sin more, and this dog will get bigger, and you'll walk more in the flesh than the Spirit. So what are we supposed to do as Christians? Well, we're not supposed to use our liberty as an occasion for the flesh, but some Christians do. They shouldn't, but they do. And so there is a battle, there is a war, and what we have to do is we have to fight the flesh. And that's what the Christian life is. It's a warfare between the, the spirit and the flesh. As a matter of fact, we're in Galatians chapter 5 right now. Look at verse 17. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these two con are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So these two are always fighting. And if you think about this, this is always interesting to me. I've always thought about this. Here I am. This is me. I'm a new creature inside, but I'm inside a sinful, wicked body that wants to do wrong. So the truth of the matter is, I'm my own worst enemy. <laughs> you ever thought about that? I am a new creature inside that's sinless in the eyes of God, but I'm imprisoned in this wicked flesh. I'm stuck inside this prison of flesh, wanting with all my heart to get out, but I can't. I'm stuck. And sometimes I get into the flesh and do things that I shouldn't do. And I feel stupid. But yet inside the spirit grieves. Don't do that. Don't do that. And I feel bad. So I'm my own worst enemy. And I'm inside my worst enemy. I, I'm closer to my worst enemy than I am to anybody else. But thank God, closer, God's closer to me. Because he's inside me. And I am stuck inside this flesh that's outside of me. So I'm imprisoned in this veil, this mortal coil, this, this, this sinful body. So what am I to do as a Christian that's stuck in this sinful body? Because this body wants to do wrong. In a minute we're going to look at the lust of the flesh. This body has certain lusts that it wants to do. So what do I do so I don't do those? Well let's go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Remember, we're under the age of grace. We're not to use grace as an occasion to the flesh. So Paul says in Romans 6, verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So the question is, well, now that we're saved and we can't lose it, should we just go sin all we want to? Well, look what he says. God forbid! How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Paul says, even though we're saved and all our sins are forgiven, past, present, and future, that's not an excuse to go sin. That's why Paul says, use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Let's look at uh, Romans chapter 6, and let's start at verse 12. It says, well, 11. 11 says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. To be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, we read in Galatians how it says we're crucified with Christ. Our body we're supposed to look at as a dead body. Just as Christ died, we died with him and rose again with him. We still have to live in this sinful, wicked body. So we're supposed to reckon it dead. Now look what it says in verse um, 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. 
Neither yield your members as members, mis, excuse me, neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Once again, we're not under the law, we're under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid! Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? You hear that? Sin unto death? There is a sin that it talks about in another passage that's a sin unto death. That is, if a Christian decides that all he wants to do is sin and not serve the Spirit, he could sin and God will just say, okay, I'm done with him, he's dead. I don't know what that sin is, that sin unto death, but the Bible talks about that. You could actually get God so mad at you because you're his son, that he just says, all right, I'm taking him home early. I don't know. I, I would not want to test that limit, if you would. But here Paul is telling us, look, don't be a servant to sin. Be a servant to the Spirit. Follow Christ. Um, continuing verse 17, But God, we think that we, ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. So what should we be? Who should we serve? The big dog, the flesh, or little dog, the spirit? Well, the more we serve the spirit, the more that one grows, and the more that one diminishes. So the more we do right, the easier it becomes, because we have the spirit of God inside of us helping us. So we shouldn't serve the flesh, we should serve the spirit. Now Paul tells us something here interesting. Romans chapter 7, in verse 15. Paul confesses that he still sinned even though he's saved. And yet he's telling us not to. And he confessed, but I still do. Uh, Romans 7.15 says, For that which I would, or I, that which I do I allow not. For which I would I do not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. So when I sin, it's my flesh that's sinning. That new creature inside can't sin. It's the flesh. So you yield to the flesh, and that's what makes you sin. And he says, that is, Now it is then no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, I'm in verse 18, he says, That is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, excuse me, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that do I. Now if I do that, I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me, which dwells where? In the flesh. I then find a law, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Paul says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Hmm. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So Paul says there is a great big war for every Christian to fight. As a matter of fact, Paul calls the Christian life a warfare. And when Paul was about to die, he said, I have fought the good fight, I have kept the faith. He fought. What is this war? There's a war between the flesh and the spirit. And you need to pick a side. Do you want to be a fleshly, backslidden, sinful Christian? Or do you want to be a Christian that's used by God that walks in the Spirit? Well, that's where we should be. And Paul said we should reckon that dead. We should put that down. He said, oh, wretched man that I am, because I try to do right, and I still do wrong sometimes. But I want to do right and want to serve God. So until we die, we're still capable of sin. But should we sin? That's the question. We should not. And so look at 2 Timothy 2.19. 2 Timothy, of course, written by Paul. 2 Timothy 2.19, look what Paul says for us Christians to do. I like this verse. 2 Timothy 2.19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So what should we do? What is iniquity? Well, iniquity is another word for sin. So we that are Christians fighting this war, we need to get away from sin. We should depart from sin. The Bible tells us to flee certain things. There are certain times when as soon as we're tempted to do something wrong, our first thought should be no and run away from it. When you linger is when you usually give in to sin because you let your body think about it. 
Let me show you another verse here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Well, actually, let's go to 2 Timothy 2.22 since we're already in 2 Timothy. And then we'll go back. 2 Timothy 2.22. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Flee youthful, youth, youthful lust. We should flee the lust of the flesh. Whenever the flesh starts rearing its ugly head like a big old hound dog, we should flee from it and say, No, I'm not going to give in to that. Now look at 1 Corinthians 6.18. You say, Well, it's so hard to do. Uh, I just My body just wants to do right. That's no excuse. You see, before when you were under the law, you had to live right in the flesh. Now that you're saved, God wants you to live right, but you've got the Holy Spirit inside to help you. It should be easier now to live right than back then. And yet people think, oh, it's so hard. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 18. Flee fornication, it says. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. God says, look, that's my body. Don't do something with it that you shouldn't do with it. When you get that lust in your, in your head, that idea of I want to do something wrong, flee! Run away! Get as far away from it as you can. I like this verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There are people that say, well, I just can't help myself. Yeah, you can. If you have the Holy Spirit inside, your, inside you, you can help yourself from sinning. You don't have to. Now, you're going to. <laughs> Let's just set her down that there will be times that you give in to the flesh. Paul even said, the things that I would not, those I do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? He said, I hate this, that I'm still in a sinful flesh and I do wrong sometimes. I hate it. Well, God says you don't have to. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. It says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, able, but will, with the temptation, make a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. So there is always, listen to this, always a way out when, God, when, when the temptation comes to sin. You just have to look for it. You have to say, God, how do I get away from this sin? I don't know what your sins are. There are so many different sins. We're going to go look at a list of sins. But whenever you are tempted to do a sin, your first thought as a Christian should be, how do I not do this? What can I do to keep myself from doing this? How can I get out of it? That should be our first thought. God does not want us to sin as Christians, and yet we do. Well, does that mean we lose our salvation? No. Go to thecloudchurch.org, past sermons, look up eternal security. We are saved. When, it, when we sin, it's the body that sins. But the spirit and the soul, those are forgiven. The body is not yet saved. We're waiting for the glorified body. So the body has desires that sometimes we give in to. But even if we do, we're still saved. But we should do the best we can as Christians to stay away from sin and not sin. So back to Galatians chapter 5. In verse 13, now we see why Paul says, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. That's free will. Use your free will to serve each other and to live for God and not give in to the lust of the flesh. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So love is fulfilling the law. That's what he's saying. When Jesus came, look what Jesus said in Matthew 22. In Matthew 22, you say, well, are you saying we're under the law? No, we're not under the law. But Jesus said that if you really want to know what the law is, it's all fulfilled in one thing, love. Yet, people that followed the law in the Old Testament had no love. All those Old Testament Pharisees were, were under the law and followed it when Jesus came. And guess what they did? They killed them. They didn't love Jesus. So, they didn't really understand the law. The law was God saying, show me how much you love me by serving me and doing what I say. And very few people under the law ever fulfilled the law out of love. They did it because they had to. Because it was a command where they had to do it. They didn't really want to. But Matthew chapter 22, in verse 34. And we read, But when the Pharisees had heard that they had put the that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. 
Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, all right, a guy's asking Jesus a question when Jesus was on the earth. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Why did Jesus say that? Because if you truly loved someone, you would fulfill the law. Because if you truly love someone, you would serve them, you'd do everything they'd say. So no one ever loved God enough to complete the law except Jesus. And he loved us enough to fulfill the law and then even die for us. So what is the law? Well, it's all about love. And guess what? <laughs> Very few people had enough love in the Old Testament to do everything God said under the law. So obviously there's some free will involved. I'm not a Calvinist. I believe people have the free will to do right or to do wrong. One thing that bothers me, there's so many people that say, claim to be Calvinists nowadays. Well, Calvinist says there's no such thing as free will. Whatever God wants to happen is going to happen. All right, well, um, what if someone came into your house and raped your wife or raped your sister? Would that be God allowing that to happen? That's stupid. That's someone doing a work of the flesh of their own free will, doing evil because they wanted to. And that's not God saying, okay, you do this, and God made them do that. If you're a Calvinist, you have to believe that God made them rape somebody or kill somebody. No, it's all about doing things because you want to. It's all about love. So go back to Galatians chapter 5. I'm not a Calvinist. I believe in free will. And that's what God wants under grace. Us of our own free will to serve Him and show Him love. Those that are married can understand that. If you're a man and you're married, what do you want? You want your wife to serve you because she wants to. You don't want her to obey you just because she has to. Because then she will do it without love and it will be just repetitive and you'll just see that she's just doing it and you won't know that she loves you. You want to be loved. You want someone to do something because you love them. Vice versa. If you're a wife, you want your husband to love you. You don't want to just live with him and him not love you. Love is important. But what is love? Love is an action proven by Jesus. The action of dying. Love is dying to self for others. That's what we're to do. Die to self, the flesh, for Jesus. Put the flesh down and obey the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so back to Galatians chapter 5. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Bite and devour one another. What was going on? What is he talking about? Remember, this was written by Paul. In about 58 A.D., if my Bible note is right, and he's writing to a church full of people that are saved. And he's telling them, there are people that came into that church that are preaching lies and trying to get you back under bondage. And he says, don't accept that. Don't believe it. Trust what we've taught you, the gospel and salvation. But then he says, but now you all are dividing, biting each other. Who, what does that mean? Well, this side is persecuting this side. We've seen that already, that they've, they're persecuting. And he says, don't do that. And take heed lest you be consumed one of another. What is he talking about? Well, sadly, they were arguing and attacking one another. And, and one said, well, I believe this. The other said, I believe this. And rather than get along and believe the same thing and walk in the Spirit, they were walking in the flesh. Let's go to Goli um, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. One of the most fleshly, carnal, wicked churches in the entire Bible is, is the church of Corinthians. And you read through the, uh, the church of Corinth, and you find that a lot of bad things were going on, and a lot of people who claimed to be Christians were doing the works of the flesh rather than walking in the Spirit. <clears throat> and that troubled Paul, and he didn't like that. And look what he said to him in chapter 3, and verse 1 of 1 Corinthians. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. He said, you're all a bunch of babies. You haven't grown up in Christ. You're just acting like a bunch of children, a bunch of kids, is what he said. Why? Well, verse 3 says, For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying, strife, and divisions, are you not carnal, and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believe, even as the Lord gave to every man? 
So Paul says, look, you guys, all you do is attack each other and fight and envy and strife and carnal divisions. He says, you're just carnal. So what is he saying? He's saying you're acting carnal. This is carnal over here. Carnal is following the flesh. Over here, we're to be spiritual. We're supposed to walk in the spirit. Well, the sad thing about churches nowadays is many churches, instead of walking in the flesh, they get in the spirit and there's church splits. There's an old joke that says the Baptist churches can't, don't know how to start churches unless they church split. That's the only way that Baptists start another church is by splitting the church. And then there's two. And they split them so much that there's a bunch of churches out there that are nothing but splinters. <laughs> That's the old church. That's the old joke about the Baptist churches. Well, why is it like that? I've been in a lot of churches in my life and I've seen a lot of church splits. And it's sad. And why is it? Why is it they bite and devour each other? Why is there envy and strife? It's because people are walking in the flesh rather than in the spirit. And that should not be. But yet today, a lot of Christians are doing that. A lot of Christians are attacking each other rather than simply being a blessing to others. But God wants us to do right. Look at 1 Corinthians. Well, we already went there. Uh, we went to 1 Corinthians. So let's go back to Galatians chapter 5. In verse 15, but if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. So don't fight. Don't be carnal. So if we're not to do that, then what should we do? Verse 16, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you should not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So what are we to do? We're to walk in the Spirit of God. That is why it's so important to follow the Holy Spirit. And how do we follow the Holy Spirit? By following the truth of the Gospel and following the Bible. Be careful of people who say, the Holy Spirit talked to me and said this. The only way that the Holy Spirit talks to us today is through the Scriptures. We read the Bible and that's how God talked to us. The Bible says we have a more sure word of prophecy. More sure than what? Than an angel speaking from heaven. God the Holy Spirit speaks to us today through the Word. And He speaks to us, tells us what to do, and we need to follow Him. And we need to walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh, because when you get in the flesh, it's easy to hurt somebody. And if you hurt somebody, well, let's just say it this way. I've seen a lot of people in churches get hurt by people that said something that wasn't true. And they're out of church now. A lot of the people that, that I'm reaching through the internet here are probably people that were in church for a long time, but they got hurt. And now they don't go to church. And they're looking to hear the truth, and they can't find a good church that preaches truth anymore, so they don't go to church. Well, it's hard to walk in the Spirit without having fellowship with other Christians without reading and studying the Bible and hearing preaching and teaching. So it's important to walk in the Spirit. And how do we do that? By being around other Christians and listening to the truth. So it's just sad to me in this day and age in which we live. I've seen it. Maybe you have too. There are very, 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 very many people who claim to be Christians who are very carnal. And all they know how to do is attack and ridicule and put down and make fun of and mock others. And I'll tell you this right here, a person like that is either number one, not saved, or number two, saved, but given wholly to the flesh, and as carnal as they can be. And I don't have a use for either one of them. And you shouldn't either. Don't allow a person who claims to be a Christian to walk in the flesh. Instead, they should walk in the Spirit. And what we're going to look at now is the difference between walking in the flesh and walking in the Spirit. And, and what the fruits are of each one. So let's continue. Verse 16 says, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's that simple. Just walk in the Spirit, live for God, and it, the more you live for God, the easier it is to not fill, fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, verse 17, For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so they cannot do the things that you would. And we looked at that verse earlier. There's your warfare. The flesh fighting the Spirit like two dogs fighting each other. Which side are you going to strengthen so he can defeat the other. You're going to strengthen the flesh so he whips the spirit, so you walk in the spirit all the time, I mean flesh all the time? Or are you going to give more attention and time to the spirit so that you fight the flesh and not give in to the desires of the flesh? So you don't be carnal. Now, verse 18. But if you be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. Once again, another verse that tells us we're not under the law. If we're saved and we have the Holy Spirit of God, we're not under the law. How many times do we have to look at Bible verses that say we're not under the law? Yet you can't turn on the TV today 
on Sunday without hearing a preacher say, now if you keep the law and your good works outweigh your bad works, you just, you just maybe might sort of possibly go to heaven. We'll never know. Why? Because you can't know if you're saved by works. You can only know if you're saved by trusting the finished work of Jesus Christ. Continue, verse 13, I mean 19. And this is what's very interesting to me. This is what we call the works of the flesh. And what we're about to see here mentioned on the works of the flesh is that there are 18 works of the flesh, 18 things that Paul mentions that he calls the works of the flesh. You know what 18 is? 6 plus 6 plus 6. <laughs> the Bible says the number of man is 666. You go to Revelation, I believe it's 13, 18. What's 18? 6 plus 6 plus 6. Revelation 13 says this is the number of man, and then it says it's the number of the beast. Well, the number of the beast and the number of man is 666. I, just, I think it's interesting that Paul mentions 18 works of the flesh which is 6 plus 6 plus 6. Is there something to that, or am I just reading into it? You figure it out. I just think that's interesting. So what are these 18 works of the flesh? Number one, I'll just read them uh, briefly. One is adultery. Two is fornication. Three is uncleanliness. Four is lasciviousness. Five is idolatry. Six is witchcraft. Seven is hatred. Eight is variance. Nine is emulations. Ten is wrath. Eleven is strife. Twelve is seditions. Thirteen is heresies. 14 is envyings, envyings, 15 is murderers, or murders, 16 is drunkenness, 17 is revelings, and then it says 18 and such like. So the such like is a mention of whatever else. <laughs> but there's 18 total. I wrote numbers on top of each one in my Bible and counted out 18 times he mentions something that's a work of the flesh. 6 plus 6 plus 6. Interesting. So let's begin again at verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are these. Adultery. All right, what is adultery? A man or a woman who's married having sex with someone else. Uh, either they could be single and have sex with someone who's married, or a married person having single, having sex with another person, single or not. If someone is married and outside of wedlock are having, or outside, how would I explain that? Someone having sex with someone they shouldn't have sex with because they're married or else they're married. That's adultery. That is different from fornication. Fornication is two people coming together and engaging in a sexual act when they're not married. So you need to be married to have sex. And when you are married, only have sex with your partner, not anybody else. So the first two have to deal with the flesh. Adultery, fornication. Uncleanness. Uncleanness. Well, that's interesting. One of the works of the flesh is being unclean. Um, there's a saying, and it's not in the Bible, but they say cleanliness is next to godliness. Well, if you're a Christian, you ought to want to be clean. You want to have a haircut, dress up, look nice. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Being clean is a good thing. Now, it says lasciviousness. Now, look at that. What is lasciviousness? Lasciviousness means unbridled sex. It's giving yourself over completely to the flesh and the sexual desires, almost like an orgy, if you will. Are, are just giving into it. So look right in there. Uncleanliness is right in between sexual sins. So that uncleanliness probably has to do with having an unclean body because you give yourself to living a loose lifestyle, fornicating with people. Because of that, you're unclean. Not sure, but it's in the context there. Next, in verse 20, it says idolatry. Idolatry is the work of the flesh. We should not worship idols. And he's talking here to people that were Gentiles that used to worship idols. All the Gentiles worship idols. But just a little statue isn't an idol. You can make an idol out of a person. There's a TV show called American Idol. I hate that. I will not watch that. It's disgusting. Idol? I mean, God warns us of idols, and yet people love, I, people claim to be Christians. Oh, I love American Idol. It's an idol! Can't you see what the Bible says? Don't have idols! <laughs> That's given into the work of the flesh. Um, <clears throat> witchcraft. Look at that. Now, a lot of people, they don't know what witchcraft is. When you say witchcraft, they say, oh, somebody who just believes that they're a witch and believes that they can do witchcraft and things like that. And they don't think that there really is such a thing as witchcraft. There is 
and things such as witchcraft. And what witchcraft is, it's getting in contact with the spirit world and having demons do things for you. So if you were a witch and you cast a spell on someone, that demon would go and repress that somebody. Witchcraft is very will, uh, real, and it's around today. And it's a work of the flesh, the Bible says, and it's something evil. It is something that we as Christians should not practice. Now, witchcraft in the, uh, in the Greek language, it's interesting, is pharmakia, from where we get the word pharmacy in English, which are what? Drugs. And one thing we need to do, we need to stay as far away from drugs as we can. Crack and marijuana and things like that, they open the door to the spirit world. And they're a way for people to, get, to open themselves to demonic influence. So we should stay away from things like that. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred. Hatred is the worst work of the flesh. Variance, it says. Variance. Emulations. What's emulation? Jealousy. Wrath. Strife. Seditions. Heresies. What are heresies? False doctrines. It says envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. So these are things that we who are Christians should not do. If you're a Christian, are you guilty of any of those? You say, I'm not an adulterer or a fornicator or uh, I don't go to orgies, I don't worship idols, I don't do witchcraft. Okay, well, do you get angry? <laughs> do you have hatred in your heart for another Christian? Uh, you know, these sound like they're really bad, but then as we go along, they're not that bad. Uh, there's nothing wrong with getting angry sometimes. Unless you have anger and bitterness in your heart toward another person. That's not right. That's not something that God wants. Uh, we're not supposed to be bitter toward others. And he says, uh, verse 21, Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I, have told you also, uh, as I also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit, inherit the kingdom of God. Alright, so way out here after the rapture, there's the tribulation time. And over here, we have the millennium. So, what is it talking about? They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, that's today. There's a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven now here. So what does it mean? Well, after the rapture, up here in the clouds, there's what's called the judgment seat of Christ. That's where we who are Christians get inheritance. inheritance. So it looks like, according to this verse, that if you live for the flesh then you won't get any rewards when you get to heaven. But the more you do for the Lord in the Spirit, the more rewards you're likely to get at the judgment seat of Christ. Let's look at that briefly. Uh, Colossians 3, 23. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. So what is the reward of the inheritance? Well, there's rewards that you can receive as a Christian. Let's look at some of those. Um, first, oh, I'm past my notes, so I guess that's good. <laughs> uh, 1 Corinthians, I believe it's in 1 Corinthians 3. It might be 2 Corinthians 3. Let me look real quick. Wait, all right, it must be 2 Corinthians chapter 3. No, 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 it is. It's 1 Corinthians 3. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and verse 11. It says, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build up on this foundation, now look what it says you can build upon Jesus, your inheritance. It says, If any man build gold, silver, precious stones, or it says wood, hay, or stubble. So three things are mentioned in their a comparison. It says, If any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hair, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. And if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so by fire. So what this is talking about is the judgment seat of Christ for Christians. See, there's another Christian uh, uh, judgment out here for the lost. It's called the great white throne of judgment. This is for lost people. But saved people, those of us who are saved, when we go at the rapture, we get judged. And up in heaven, we're not judged for our sins because our sins are paid for here. 
We're judged for our service for Christ. And God, it looks like God takes everything you've done for Him and everything you've done in the flesh and puts it in a fire. And everything that's done for Him comes through as either gold or silver or precious stone. And precious stones are like gems. And this is what you get as an inheritance for serving Jesus Christ. Now, will you be able to keep that and take it with you wherever you go in the millennium? I don't know. There's some things that I don't understand. But Paul says that, that when that happens, that judgment seat of Christ, the things we did for us will burn up. The things we did for Jesus will remain. So can you imagine living on this earth and just being a carnal, wicked, evil person and being saved? And God takes it and puts it there, and it's just like the gigantic flame. And everybody in heaven looks and goes, he must not have loved the Lord too much. And can you imagine suffering your whole life like Paul, being in prison, being whipped, being mocked, and go up there, and God put it all in, and just a little flame raises up, and all this inheritance comes out? I don't understand. I don't know how or why, but all I know is the Bible talks about the judgment seat of Christ, and that's what it's like, God taking what we've done after we're saved, and what we did for ourselves will burn up, what we did for Jesus will come through. It might just be that we get all that stuff and just immediately say, God, I don't deserve this, and throw it at his feet. It's like they take those crowns off in Revelation and throw it at his feet and say, Thou art worthy, O Lord. But the Bible teaches about the, the judgment seat of Christ, and what we've done for him will be made manifest. And there's a couple other verses. I'll, I'll go into that in a different teaching. I want to go ahead and finish this up. So there are the works of the flesh, and there's 18 of them. The last one's kind of vague, so it's such like things. But 6 plus 6 plus 6, so the works of the flesh. Now look at verse 22. We have a comparison. And the whole book of Galatians is a comparison. One thing's like this, but this is the way it is. This is the way you guys believe. This is the truth. This is the law, which is uh, works. This is salvation, which is faith, uh, grace. So it's a comparison. And so what Paul's about to make here as well is another comparison. He makes a comparison from the works of the flesh... So now he's going to tell us what the fruit of the Spirit is. So he's, he's showing comparison. I like how Paul is so, how do you explain it? He's just so well-minded that he knows this is the opposite of this. And that's how you learn things. You look, and that's called discernment. You discern what's right and what's wrong. There's no in-between. It's either one side or the other. There's very few gray areas. It's either black or white. It's either up or down. It's either good or bad with God. And what the world tries to do is try to mix up and say, oh, it's not that bad. For example, fornication. When I was in Honduras as a missionary, I had a um, Spanish teacher from Spain. And he was telling me about all his sexual exploits and how many women he slept with. And I said, look, man, I said, that's sin. That's called fornication. And it's wrong. He laughed. He goes, oh, come on. That's just natural. That's what everybody does. And he seriously thought there was nothing wrong with fornication. Well, here in America... When I was a child, they preached against it in churches. Very few today do. And they don't call it fornication. They call it premarital sex. Or they call it uh, hooking up or coming together. You see, they take a word that's strong that the Bible uses, that when you hear that word, you say, oh, and you feel bad. And they change the definition or they change the word so it doesn't sound so bad. So more and more people can do it. It's still sin. Whether it sounds good or not, it's still sin. So we need to stay away from the works of the flesh. Back to chapter 22. Excuse me, chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So there are nine fruits of the Spirit. So over here we had 18 works of the flesh. Well, over here there are nine fruits of the Spirit. What's the number nine? I guess now is a good time to show uh, the numbers Spiritual, I mean, biblical numerics. I don't know if you know the Bible. I guess i got room over there to write it. But in the Bible, different numbers mean things. And this is a, a neat teaching in itself. Something that's interesting. Um, so I'm just going to give you a couple examples. I hope that's still on the thing. Number one is just unity. Number two is division. Number three is like the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, I don't know how to explain three. Four would be the number of the world or earth. Five is the number of death. Six is the number of man. 
Seven is the number of completion or perfection. Eight is the number of um, new beginnings. Nine is the number of fruit. Ten is the number of the Gentiles. Dun, dun, dun. Eleven is the number of judgment. Thirteen is the number of rebellion. Forty is the number of probation. All right, I don't know who came up with this, but there have been lots of books written about what they call biblical numerics. What different numbers mean in the Bible. And right here, we look at the nine fruits of the Spirit. Well, nine is the number of fruit. And it just so happens there's actually nine fruits of the Spirit. That's interesting. Four is the number of the world. The Bible talks about the four corners of the earth. There's four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. Five is the number of death. Well, some people say, well, no, that's the number of grace. Okay, number of grace, too. How many deadly wounds did Jesus have when he died? What does it say when he died in Genesis 5.5? If five is the number of death, Genesis 5.5, did somebody die? Well, as a matter of fact, I believe so, Genesis chapter 5. So as you read through the Bible, it's interesting how God allowed whoever did it to put in the chapter verse markings. And it's interesting how over and over and again, a lot of times the numbers correspond to the meaning of the numbers of biblical numerics. So Genesis 5.5, 5, And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. So 5.5, 5, double death, double nickel. Adam died. Completion or perfection is the number 7. God does everything in sevens. There's seven judgments. There's 7,000 years of history. There's seven feasts of Israel. There's seven resurrections. I mean, I could just seven, 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 everything seven with God to complete everything. Um, new beginnings, number eight. Number eight is starting over or a new beginning. Nine is the number of fruit. Ten is the number of Gentiles. Eleven the number of judgment. Thirteen the number of rebellion. Nimrod was the thirteenth from Adam. And fourteen is the number of probation. Four, forty years, I mean, not fourteen, forty. So there are a thing called biblical numerics, and the different numbers have different meanings, and it's fun as you read through the Bible to see certain things, looking at the verses as well as the numbers. So here God is talking, and he tells us what the fruits of the Spirit are. Number one is love. What well, we looked at last time, and a little bit this time, the importance of love. It's so important to love one another as Christians, and to love God, because God loved us so much that he died for us. Joy. As a Christian, we should have joy. Where does our joy come from? Knowing that we're saved. So if you know you're saved, that should make you joyful. Knowing, hey, no matter what, I'm going to heaven. And I'm, I'm glad. Um, you should be excited that you're saved. It says, love, joy, peace. All right, when you're saved, you have peace with God. There should be no, like this side, people in the law, there should be no, oh, I just hope I go to heaven. I just hope I did enough. You don't live like that as a Christian. As a Christian, you go, I'm saved and I know it. It's all because what Jesus did. Man, I've got peace in my heart knowing that I'm saved. Long-suffering. Long-suffering is like charity. You put up with something for a long time before you, you, know, you, you, you say something. Gentleness. Gentleness. Goodness. Just doing good. Faith. Meekness. Temperance. Temperance means self-control. As a Christian, we should have self-control. Against such, there is no law. Now, how many people do you know that are Christians that have all these works of the flesh? And how many people do you know that claim to be Christians that have the fruits of the Spirit? We used to go to a church, and I appreciate the pastor. I, I do. He's probably one of the greatest Bible teachers the world has ever seen. And I appreciate him teaching me the Bible. But he hardly had any, if any, of the fruits of the Spirit. He was more over on this side, angry all the time, and would call names and put people down. And it was like, wow, where are the fruits of the Spirit? <laughs> well, I've since looked at other Christians, and you know, it's hard to find a Christian that has all nine of the fruits of the Spirit. And that's what I want to be, is I want to be a Christian that has all nine of the fruits of the Spirit. I don't want to be one of these on this side that is, has just about every one of the fruits of uh, works of the flesh. So, all goes back to this. The more you do for the Lord, the more reward you'll have in glory. Okay, it looks like we'll finish this today. But if we live in the Spirit, it says, uh, let's see, where am I? Verse 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. 
If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. So three things that a Christian should not desire. Are you ready for that? Vain glory. A Christian should never brag on himself and say, look how great I am. Well, I speak Spanish, and in the Spanish world, there's still not a perfect Bible in Spanish. Several people are working on it. The groups are working on getting a pure Spanish Bible like our King James Bible. But one man has come along come along, produced what he thinks is a good version, and yet he brags on himself and even named the Bible after himself. Full of vain glory. And you read the work, and there's problems in it still. But yet many people are beginning to follow that man and brag on the man rather than brag on Jesus. It's really sad. Provoking one another. We shouldn't provoke other Christians in the sense of just being mean to do it. The Bible says we're to provoke one another together in good works. So you can encourage a guy, hey man, you want to do this? But we shouldn't just go, eh, and make fun of people and provoke them that way. And then it says envying one another. We should never envy someone else. There's a verse that says, they that compare themselves among themselves are not wise. We should never look at somebody else and say, boy, I wish I was like that person. I wish I had what he had. Do you know what lust is? You know, one of the Ten Commandments was, thou shalt not lust. You know what lust is? Wishing that you had something that wasn't yours. That's called covetousness. That's what covet. Coveting is wishing you had something that belongs to someone else. One time I was in the car with my dad years ago, driving down the road. And we're just driving along, and my dad's so smart. I knew the Bible so well. We had good talks about the Bible. My dad, we're driving, and I guess a guy passed us with a, just this beautiful, beautiful boat behind his car. And passed us. And just drove on down the road. And my dad, if you'd known him, he drives really slow. He did. He drove really slow. And my dad said, boy, I wish I had that boat. And I was in Bible school at the time. And I looked at my dad and I said, what? He said, I wish I had that boat. I said, dad, that's covetous. That's wishing you had something that belonged to someone else. And that's awful. And my dad goes, you're right, son. I'm sorry. I said, you know what you could say, dad? You could say, I wish I had a boat like that one. There's nothing wrong with wanting a boat like that one. But if you want that boat, that's a sin. <laughs> My dad said, that's pretty smart, son. <laughs> and he's right. That's what covetousness is. There's nothing wrong with wanting something. If you can afford it and you can buy it and you want to have that. But it's wrong when you want it and it belongs to somebody else. That's covetousness. Now, if it's in a business and it's for sale then it's available to you. You can buy it. But if a man has already bought it and that's his and you want that, that's a sin. So that looks like that's about it. Um, we've looked at the fruits of the Spirit. I forgot to mention one thing about the nine fruits of the Spirit. The first three are inward. The next three are outward. And the third, last three, are toward God. And I'll close with that. Love, joy, and peace. Those are all things that you have inside. If you have love, joy, and peace, then guess what you'll be able to do? You'll be able to be long-suffering, gentle, and good toward others. So once you get saved, you have the Holy Spirit inside. It works in you, giving you joy, love, and peace. And now you need to work those out. Work out long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. So the first three are inward. The second three are outward. And the last three are toward God. And what are they? Faith, meekness, and temperance. Faith, meekness, and temperance. Those are things you show God that you have because of the other six that you have. So that's kind of interesting that the, the nine fruits of the Spirit, first three are inward, the next three are something you practice outward, and the last three are something that you show God. Kind of interesting. I just had that in the Bible notes, so I needed to, to present that. So that brings us to the end of Galatians chapter 5. A lot of stuff to study. I believe that we uh, got through it, and I look forward to next time studying chapter 6 of Galatians. I uh, appreciate you being with us. I hope that this was a good study and you learned something. Um, just a lot of things to cover. But just remember this. If you're a Christian, walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. Give what God wants. How do you serve God? You simply read your Bible and pray and tell others about Jesus Christ. Give others the gospel. That's the easiest way to please Jesus Christ. And a lot of people today, they want to please themselves rather than please the Lord. And someday, it'll show. 
If you think you're a Christian and you can do whatever you want, and you think, hey, nobody will ever know, there will be a day when all Christians are in heaven and each one of them is judged according to their works. Now, they're not judged whether they're going to heaven or hell. No, no, no. Their God's going to say, let's see how much you served me. And we're going to take everything you did for the flesh and everything you did for me, and we're just going to put them in a fire and see what comes out. And what you've done for Jesus will come out. What you did for yourself will make the biggest black smokestack in heaven. And I just tell you, it might be embarrassing. That's why it's so important to do something for Jesus Christ in the time we have left. Thank you for watching. God bless you. We'll, we'll catch you next time. Thanks.